I want to talk to you about how to know if you have the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're asking this question in fear, wondering if the Holy Spirit has abandoned you. Or maybe you're asking if the signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit are actually being displayed in your life. I believe, and I know by the Word of God, if you are a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit does indeed dwell in you. So I want to talk to you about what those signs are that His presence and power dwell in you. Number one, confidence in your salvation. Now, I don't want you to panic here because sometimes when people hear this point, and I make this point about confidence in salvation, they become worried because they say, well, there are times when I do doubt my salvation or I fear that ultimately I might be rejected by God. But that fear alone doesn't necessarily mean that you don't belong to God. Of course, we understand that the Holy Spirit gives us that assurance of salvation. But you have to remember that the flesh still is at work, that demons still lie to you, the enemy still attacks you. So remember that it's not a matter of having no doubt at all, but ultimately having that assurance within you, even in the face of those doubts and the lies of the enemy. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 16. And I want you to look at what the scripture says here, verses 16 and 17. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are children of God. Again, if you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Especially if you read Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it becomes absolutely clear that the Holy Spirit is present at the very moment of salvation. You don't need to be afraid that he's abandoned you just because you made a mistake. You don't need to be afraid that he's rejected you just because you're not perfect. For believers, it's not about being perfect. It's about being perfected, submitted to the process of sanctification that only comes by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So again, don't be worried if there are moments of questioning, moments of confusion. Again, the enemy is very tricky and he'll try to lie to you. And maybe you have those bouts of doubt and every so often a fear might hit you. By the way, if you do struggle with intrusive thoughts like that or fear-based thoughts or even just those whims, those doubtful whims that come across the mind, I want you to be hyper aware of the fact that the enemy uses your weaknesses against you. There are things about you that will be both challenges and blessings. I'll use myself as an example. I'm a very deep thinker and I often think about the details. I can't let the details go. Now, that can be a strength, especially when it comes to preparing messages or when it comes to doing things with excellence, but that can also be a very big challenge for me, especially if I turn that magnifying glass back on myself. I can be hypercritical of myself. I can be hypercritical of others. I can be dissatisfied even when things are going well. I can notice what's missing even when there are many blessings present. So I have to work through those challenges. Now, you may struggle with a, with a very deep thought pattern. In other words, you think a lot. Maybe you're an overthinker. I don't know. Let me know in the comment section if that's you. You overthink a lot of things. And the enemy will try to use that as a disadvantage. He'll try to use that or disadvantage to you. They'll try to use that as a weak point for influence over you. And I've noticed that many Christians who struggle with overthinking also struggle with what I call religious OCD, this constant checking on the salvation, this obsessive fear with questions like, did I commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Is God ultimately going to reject me like those in Matthew chapter 7? And anytime you hear verses like that, there are these fears that rise up within you because you are prone to that type of overthinking. Thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit within us who affirms that we are children of God. So in the Spirit, He's giving you that confidence in salvation. In fact, I want you to write this in the comment section. I want you to say it by faith, and I want you to say it with boldness. I want you to type this now, He lives in me. Type those words by faith. It's your admission. It's your acknowledgement that the Holy Spirit does indeed dwell in you. You belong to him. And so the Holy Spirit within us, the scripture says, Ephesians 4.30, when we make mistakes, the Holy Spirit within us grieves over that sin. So he doesn't just abandon you because you make a mistake, nor does he condone that sin. Rather, you sense that grieving, you sense that conviction. 
So don't feel guilt just because every so often a thought may come to your mind like, what if I'm not a born again believer? Or what if God rejects me? Or what if ultimately I make a mistake that causes me to commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Side note, those who commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit don't care if they committed it or not. So that's already a good sign to you. But just be aware of how your mind works. Be aware of the fact that the enemy can use that against you and just be aware that the Holy Spirit ultimately within you is speaking of that confidence in your salvation. Number two, godly character. The greatest demonstration that you've received Christ isn't necessarily power or miracles. Rather, it's the character of Christ in you. If you can prophesy but you don't have love or you can heal the sick but you don't have love, you can preach a great message or teach a very detailed lesson, but you're not patient, you're not kind. If you give to the poor and you can sing on the worship team or you can play an instrument or you give some set of skills that you have for the advancement of the gospel, but you don't have the character of Christ in you, and that right there is going to be a challenge because when you actually begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit begins to manifest, and that is the character of Christ. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. When you think of love, the Bible here is describing selflessness. What does the Scripture say? Greater love hath no man than this, and that he laid down his life for his friends. So the biblical definition of love has to do with selflessness, the giving of yourself. Then there's joy. This is joy despite what's happening around you, that internal stabilizer, even in the face of trials and tragedies. Then there's peace, peace with God, peace with the fellow man, and peace within. And then there is patience. This has to do with the temperament or the attitude that you have with others' shortcomings and when things don't go exactly the way that you want them to go. Kindness. This is no deep revelation here, but it is a powerful one. Christians should be kind. And this is something I feel a lot of Christians are lacking in. And, and many times, if you look at the way that Christians are portrayed in movies or in pop culture, you'll notice that the impression that the world has of many Christians is that they're very mean, very rude, very entitled, very nasty. Let's not be like that. Let's let the fruit of the Spirit be demonstrated in our lives. This is kindness, goodness. What is goodness? This is moral excellence or strong character, faithfulness or reliability, gentleness in the way that you're dealing with others, self-control. This is mastery over self. There is no law against these things. And as you begin to see these, these demonstrations of godly character in your life, that's evidence to you that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Now, let me say this. Every believer has the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily have every believer. What do I mean by that? I simply mean that as a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit has been deposited in you. Not a baby Holy Spirit or new convert Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been deposited in you. You have the Holy Spirit as a born-again believer. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have the aspects of your life that you've yet to surrender? And Sadly, the answer to that is no. If we've not surrendered it to him, then he doesn't have it. So you have the fruit of the Spirit within. You have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. All of these things he's already deposited in you. So the question is now, how do you have that which has been deposited in you come to the front, come to the forefront and actually be demonstrated in your everyday life? That comes through surrender. So you have that. And this, by the way, is what it means to be spiritual. Often we picture that people who are spiritual are very, uh, you know, how, how, what's the word I'm looking for? Like stoic and serious and maybe they speak with very spiritual sounding inflections like this, almost like they're chanting. And maybe they can quote scripture in the King James Version. It sounds very poetic and eloquent and they speak in this manner as if they are not, they are not struggling with anything. There's nothing wrong with them. That right there is not necessarily spiritual. That's a personality trait, stoicism or being serious. That's a personality trait, but spirituality has to do with your character. So number one, confidence in your salvation. Number two, godly character. Number three is power. Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you 
and you'll be my witnesses telling me telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem throughout Judea in Samaria and to the ends of the earth now notice here in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that the law of stewardship this is a side note the law of stewardship is demonstrated it begins in the city of Jerusalem then the region of Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth it starts small and then spreads the, the, the kingdom of God Jesus said is like a mustard seed in other words it starts small and then it spreads but here we see the correlation between the coming of the Holy Spirit and the receiving of power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you you receive power the key to the power of the Holy Spirit is the presence of the Holy Spirit there are no special rituals no formulas you have to use uh, there's not a list of rigid protocols that you have to follow it's just the Holy Spirit it's simple it's the power of God and people who complicate it maybe they're moving in a form of godliness but ultimately they're denying the true source of power the presence of the Holy Spirit now on this note I need to make it clear that though power can be a sign that you have the Holy Spirit this does not mean that all demonstrations of power are a sign that you have the Holy Spirit I think about uh, people who practice witchcraft I think about ungodly people who preach the gospel some are doing it uh, from false motivation they don't do it for the sake of others they don't do it for the glory of God maybe they're doing ministry so they can make themselves important or make a name for themselves or have riches or whatever they perceive comes with ministry but ultimately uh, the true power of the Holy Spirit does come with the Holy Spirit's presence so that power has been deposited in you now I want to make sure that you're not being given over to legalism what is legalism legalism is man's attempt to do what only God can do legalism is man's attempt to earn what only Christ could earn on your behalf so I'm not saying that all of these signs have to be in full demonstration in your life immediately even in my own life I lack in many of these areas I could I could afford to be more like Jesus in many areas of my life trust me um, but in terms of the power of the Holy Spirit I'm saying that it's not necessary power alone is not a sign that you have the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit's presence does come with power and these demonstrations these signs don't have to be in their full mature demonstration yet you can be growing in godly character you can be growing in your confidence in salvation you could be growing in power but I'm just letting you know that when the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you all of these were instantly deposited in you if you're liking this message so far you think others can benefit it really helps when you leave a like that spreads the teaching even further number four the evidence of speaking in tongues now this is a somewhat controversial topic uh, but I'm gonna tell you what I know the scripture to teach and that is that when the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit comes upon someone one of the signs that manifests is the evidence of speaking in tongues now some might say well I thought that not all believers have the gift of speaking in tongues if you look at 1st Corinthians chapter 14 what Paul is talking about is the prophetic expression of the gift of tongues used in the context of public church assembly which commands the collective attention of those assembled and is used unto the benefit of all what I'm talking about is 1st Corinthians chapter 14 verses 2 and 4 which is the personal prayer language that edifies you that no one understands no it's not just an earthly language the Bible makes that absolutely clear we see that of course in the writings of Paul but when we look in Acts chapter 2 for example when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place verse 2 and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance so here we see that the presence of the Holy Spirit comes with the demonstration which is the evidence of speaking in tongues now let me tell you what I am not saying I am not saying that you have to speak in tongues to be saved I am not saying that speaking in tongues is the ultimate sign that you've received salvation what I am saying is that if you've received the Holy Spirit at salvation then the potential to speak in tongues the potential to use your heavenly prayer language has already been deposited in you and so only those who have the Holy Spirit can truly speak in tongues but I'm not saying that you have to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit in fact the Holy Spirit comes upon you first and then what comes out of that presence and that power is the evidence of speaking in tongues so here's one of the signs 
that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Number five, very important, a love for Jesus. Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Listen to this. This is beautiful. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That's Romans 5, 5. Now here, the scripture is telling us that the Holy Spirit is the one who deposits that love. He, he fans into flame the fires of your love for Jesus. He kindles that passion for the Lord. No one on earth, please hear me now, no one on earth is more passionate about or in love with Jesus than the person of the Holy Spirit. And this is why those who have the Holy Spirit come into that same love. I pray all the time, Holy Spirit, help me love Jesus like you love Jesus. Help me be as focused on Jesus as you are on Jesus. What does Jesus say? Jesus says that the, 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 the role of the Holy Spirit, or one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit, is to glorify Him. In other words, the Holy Spirit points to Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. He highlights Jesus. He reminds us of the words of Jesus. That's the primary role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, to point us to Jesus, to make Him more real to us. And be careful with the way I say that. I'm not saying that He's not real, and then the Holy Spirit makes Him real. I'm saying that the Holy Spirit makes Him real to us. You know that there are moments when I'm spending time with the Holy Spirit where the presence of Jesus becomes more real to me than my own physical body. There are moments like when maybe you see in those services that we do around the world where we're worshiping with those great crowds of people and the power of God is manifesting. There are moments in those services where the power of the Holy Spirit, I can sense it so strong, the power. I'm not calling the Holy Spirit in it. I'm calling his power in it. Where that power, I can sense it so strong that the presence of Jesus becomes more real to me than the people gathered. The presence of Jesus becomes more real to me than the platform I'm standing on. And I feel like I've, I'm raptured into this heavenly experience that comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. As I wrote in Carriers of the Glory in 2015, I believe it was, the Holy Spirit makes Jesus more real to you. Number six, revelation or knowledge of truth. John 14, 26, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. Here we see that the Holy Spirit takes the word and causes it to not just be information, but it becomes revelation. You know, sometimes when we read the scripture and the flesh is trying to distract us, the flesh, by the way, is always looking for distraction. Even now, the flesh might be trying to distract you to click on something else or to get out of this. That's because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so the flesh constantly pulls for our attention. But, but here in John 14, 26, the scripture tells us that, that the Holy Spirit guides us in truth, that he teaches us everything. And, and sometimes when we're reading the word, the flesh distracts us. The mind gets cluttered with fears, with doubts, with questions, with responsibilities, with hurts, with pains, right? and all this clutter begins to affect the mind. This is why you have to be attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, because one of the signs that the Holy Spirit dwells in you is there's this revelation. You know what revelation is? It's knowledge set on fire by the Holy Ghost. I like to say that all that can be known of God is known of the Holy Spirit, is known by the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit is God. All that can be known of God is known by the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and the Holy Spirit communicates that truth to you. Therefore, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You already in your spirit know God. You already in your spirit are connected with God. You already in your spirit are one with the Holy Spirit. So that revelation knowledge has already been deposited in you, by way of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So then revelation is not me receiving new information. Revelation is when that which I understand in my spirit becomes understood with my natural mind. It's when that which has been deposited in me begins to affect the outer shells of who I am. That's revelation. Revelation brings transformation. And that comes by the Holy Spirit. You know, when you have the Holy Spirit and you're surrendered to him, as you read the word, it's not just genealogies and history and facts. 
It's not just teachings and proverbs and historical records. Rather, as you begin to read the word, what did Jesus say in John chapter 6? My words are spirit and life. As you begin to pour over the scripture, there's this fire in you and there's this hunger and there's this inner stirring to where the, the revelation is jumping off the pages, where it's like the Holy Spirit is taking a golden highlighter and just making the words jump off the page or the screen or whatever you read it on, and it becomes a part of you and it transforms you. That's revelation by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the signs that he dwells with you. Number seven, by the way, is going to be similar to number eight. There, there's a little nuance between them that makes them different. So I'll, I'll go to number seven first. Number seven, a desire for holiness. Now remember, just a few moments ago, probably a few minutes ago actually, I mentioned to you that as a born-again believer, it's not necessarily about being perfect, but about being perfected. Not about being complete, but about being submitted to the process of completion. He who began a good work in you is faithful to finish it. Unto that day of salvation, he will finish it. There's a work that's being completed in you. There's a work that he's doing now. And you may feel sometimes like you're not getting it right because we all fall short. We all fail. Now, now I understand you don't use that as a license to sin. You're not saying, well, I fail sometimes, so let me just give in to this. I know that's not you. You're trying. Maybe you identify with Paul, who wrote, the things I want to do, I can't seem to do them. And the things, the things I don't want to do, I just find myself doing them again and again and again. Who's going to save me? This wretched person that I am. Who will redeem me? Who will rescue me? There's this great desperation in that plea. And maybe you become so frustrated with yourself sometime, sometimes that you feel like you're fake. You feel like God's rejected you. This is for you. Ezekiel 36, 27. Listen to this. This is, this is, this is a staggering truth. Father, let us help us receive this. Holy Spirit, give them eyes to see and ears to hear, I pray. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Legalism says, if you perform unto perfection, God will give you his Holy Spirit. The truth says that you cannot perform until you have his presence and power within you. Many of us think that God gives the Holy Spirit to us as a reward for doing good. That's not the way it works. First, he deposits the Holy Spirit within us, and then we begin to do good. Look what it says, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Romans 8, 26, I love this. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And in verse 27, it talks about how he, 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 he pleads for us in harmony with God's will. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one pulling in you into alignment. The Holy Spirit is the one who's sanctifying you. The Holy Spirit is the one who's giving you new desires. The Holy Spirit is the one who's working on your nature. You just abide. You just have faith. Does this mean that you can go on sinning? No. Of course, you must enact discipline and willpower and confession and accountability. But you have to recognize that all of that is being done in partnership with the Holy Spirit, not separately from the Holy Spirit. You cooperate with him he will do the work, but he gives you that desire for holiness. Are you frustrated with yourself? Do you, do you get bothered by the fact that you can't overcome that sinful mistake? Are you grieved within your spirit when you can't seem to break away from that habit or that addiction or that character flaw? It's proof to you the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Otherwise, who is within you fighting these things? If you didn't have the Holy Spirit you wouldn't be fighting with the flesh. You would just be in the flesh. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be wrestling against sin. You would just be in sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit within you gives you these new desires. So number seven is a desire for holiness. Number eight is holiness. You actually begin to see the fruit of this. And this is his doing. What must you do? Read the word every day, pray every day, worship, just submit to the process. I've talked to so many young men 
by the way, on a side note, and I don't, I don't mean to alienate the women, but just in the experience that I have, I don't counsel women one-on-one -on -one like this this intimately, but, but I, I've spoken with young men who come to me with really troubling issues, like, for example, with lust addiction and things like pornography, and they can't seem to break it. And, and, and we pray together, and we pray for deliverance, and we pray for breakthrough. And, and I ask them, you know, what, 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 are the, what are the situations you're putting yourself in that are bringing temptation? Avoid those things. I help them set up accountability, help them set up prayer groups, all of that. But, but ultimately, what I've seen is the hand of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. I've watched them say, they say things like this, you know, I just started reading the Word and praying. And even when I had a mess up, they would say, they would say, even when they messed up, they would still go and pray and read the Word. And eventually, that habit just began to break. Here's the mistake a lot of people make. And now I'm bringing it back to a more inclusive message here, everybody. What begins to happen, whatever that character flaw is, it doesn't have to be that lust issue. It doesn't have to be pornography. It could be anything. You find yourself coming back to that issue again and again. You ever notice that when you come back to that place where you've made that mistake, that the last thing you want to do is pray? The last thing you want to do is stand in a church service. The last thing you want to do is open the Bible and read it. Why? Because you're so filled with shame and guilt or frustration with yourself. That should be the first thing you do is pray and read and worship and go to church and connect with fellow believers. Why? Because that's how you abide. And you'll find that if you just make a habit of abiding, of resting in Him, prayer, the Word, worship, accountability, confession, all of these actions of surrender and submission, you'll find that something within you begins to break. Even if you don't see that transformation right away, you just continue to abide. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the holiness Spirit, and He's doing a work in you. Even when you don't see the results right away, even when you don't feel like you're making much progress, even when you feel like you took a few steps backward, He's still doing a work in you. Now again, and I'll emphasize this one last time for the sake of those who could possibly misunderstand what I'm saying, I'm not saying you just give in to sin. I'm not saying you just give in to the character flaw or the bad attitude or the bad mindset or the bad habit. I'm saying that you do what you need to do to resist those things. Recognize that while you're working at it at the level of willpower. Oh my goodness, I, I sense such a strong anointing as I'm saying this right now. While you're working at it at the level of your willpower, while you're working at it at the level of your thought control, while you're working at it at the level of practical accountability and confession, the Holy Spirit is working at it in your nature. He's transforming your heart. He's making you a new creation. You're working from the outside in. The Holy Spirit is working from the inside out. And eventually those two come together and there's breakthrough. So even though you can't see the breakthrough, he's working in you. Watch this, 1 Peter 1, 2. God the Father knew you and chose you. This is for you. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. Did you make yourself holy? No. His spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice here that the Holy Spirit comes upon you first. The Holy Spirit does the work first, and then obedience begins to result. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Sin begins to lose its allure. I'm telling you this. Eventually, you're not even going to be fighting the desire for that sin. Instead, it will become a disgust for that sin. The Holy Spirit will turn your desire for a sin, your desire for a bad habit, your desire for a bad attitude, he'll turn that desire into a disgust. Why? Because he's working at it at the level of your nature. Lord, I pray you help them receive it and surrender. Help us to do the practical as you do the impossible. Lord, we will submit to your process. We thank you that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And Lord, I pray for that one receiving this now. Give them that peace and that comfort. Break that yoke of bondage from off of them now. In Jesus' name, even now, there are bondages being broken in the Spirit. 
Religious mindsets are being broken. I give you the praise, Jesus. Bring deliverance and healing to your people, I pray. I want you to type it in the comments section. If you believe it, type amen. Well, if this message blessed you, make sure that you subscribe to my channel so that we can stay connected so that you can continue to receive my teachings on the Holy Spirit, prayer, and spiritual warfare. And now I want to invite you to get involved with helping this ministry. This ministry has been a blessing to you. The teachings have helped to bring breakthrough the events. Maybe you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit at one of the events or even watching the events live. Perhaps you're a student at the Holy Spirit School where we offer free e-courses online. However you've been impacted by this ministry, would you pay it forward today? I'm asking as many of you as are able to become right now as you watch this monthly partners. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner right now. Consider becoming a partner today for $30 a month. Think of all of the things we contribute to on a monthly basis. Gym memberships and gaming systems and entertainment and movies and coffee. You name it. It goes everywhere all the time. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have those things, but I'm asking you to consider also becoming a monthly ministry supporter. Those monthly gifts really help us to plan for the future, help us to project and actually anticipate what projects we'll be able to do. So will you do that right now? You become a monthly partner. Maybe you've been watching for a few months. You said, you know, I'd like to get involved at some point. This is bigger than all of us. This is the gospel message going forward, and it's working. We're seeing people's lives transformed. We're seeing drug addicts being set free, people being delivered. We're seeing people saved. We're seeing miracles all around the world. It's working. So we help us shine that light of the gospel all around the world. So thank you for your support. I love you. I appreciate you. I pray for you. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.